later. After I had written it down, she convinced me, just just start praying about it. So I can't even say that I prayed about it. I don't want to over-spiritualize it. I got so far as writing it in my prayer journal. 15 minutes later, I get a phone call from another friend. Hey, Lo, you need couches? I'm not kidding. This is... And not just mismatched couches, but God was like, let me show you. Let me show you what I can do. I had a full couch set, a couch, a love seat, a chair. They all matched. I had a full couch set and a super humbled full heart. God cares about the couches in my life. That was a good day. K-Love, inside the music. This is Chris Brown from Elevation Worship. Our song, Rattle, is about a resurrection. This is the sound. We've got a God who has proven over and over again that miracles are not a problem for him. And I hope Rattle gets your heart racing with expectation and the faith to believe for greater things, for impossible things in Jesus' name. Dad, the kids need you. Fathers aren't kind of an add-on. They're essential. They're core. So what should you do? We know in business, we know in work that you have goals you have to meet. Well, what's your fathering plan? Is it fair to say you believe dads need other dads to learn how to be a father? Undeniably, you're only as wise as the counsel around you. Here are a closer look at helping fathers be great dads. Go to klove.com, keyword closer look. Are you past the point of weird? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way.
Good morning. It's a special day. It's the Lord's Day. I want to thank y'all for being here this morning. We kind of, we have a, a, a group of us who are out this morning. Our youth left for camp yesterday, so my youth minister is gone. My children's minister went up to see her father, so that leaves me the, the third choice to do a quick announcement this morning, so y'all bear with me here, all right? Um, by the way, we are starting offertory back this morning, so if you already gave your, your envelopes up here, that's fine, but the good news is we're slowly starting to open back up. Word has it we're going to be starting choir probably just after VBS, so slowly but surely we're starting to get back to where we need to be. Very quickly, a couple of f few announcements before we start. Donuts with dads. It was supposed to have been last week, but um, it's going to be next Sunday. So dads, grandfathers, any kind of, of man in uh, one of our children's lives, you come and have a donut in the children's hall next Sunday morning at 9 a.m., all right? Donuts with dads, dad figures with men, especially these children, next Sunday. Number two, next Sunday is also our next VBS meeting. So if you are interested in joining VBS, if you're a helper or worker, next Sunday at 3 p.m., we will have our final VBS meeting. And then hang around because we're going to start decorations, decorating for VBS. So that's next Sunday, last Sunday in June, VBS meeting at 3 p.m., decorating shortly after that. And finally, Tracy Goodson asked me, she thanks y'all for the cardboard boxes. She has plenty of the small ones. She needs big cardboard boxes. So if y'all got any big cardboard boxes, bring your big cardboard boxes to Tracy for VBS, all right? Let's prepare our hearts. Let's enter in God's presence this morning. We come before him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is a special day, and we thank you, a day that we honor our fathers. And there are many of us that have different emotions or going through different things right now. Some of us had great relationships with our father. Some of us may not have. Some of us might have been missing our fathers who have gone on to be with you. And still others might be a father that might be struggling with uh, a child. I just pray, Father, as we enter your presence this morning, that all of us will turn our eyes to you, the perfect father that we have. Thank you for this time we had this morning. As we turn our eyes and our hearts to you, would you just meet us where we are, prepare us, as we worship you in truth and spirit this morning. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
He is amazing God. He's immortal. He's invisible. He's God, only wise. And to all life, he gives, both great and small. Let's stand together and praise him with our voices together. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, 
and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The Bible makes it clear over and over and over, we are to honor our mother and father, to honor our fathers. And this is a day that we do honor our fathers. So what I wanna do, because I know that there are uh, some of you men out there, you are father figures to so many young boys, young men that have come in your life. So I'm gonna ask all of our men, fathers and father figures, would you please stand, all my men, y'all stand. All my men, come on, stand. There we go. First and foremost, I want us ladies and my, my younger men, let's give these men a hint that they're in God's house today, okay? And I want to have a word of prayer over you and what we have for you all this morning, a special gift as you exit this morning. I'll have a few of my deacons at the doors. We've got a little special gift for every one of our men here this morning. So stay where you are. Let me pray over you this morning, this special day. We honor our fathers, our father figures. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these men in this room. Lord, in this day and age when less and less people are even gathering in corporate worship, there are a lot more women in the church than there are men. And so rather than keeping on putting down the men that are here, I want to thank you for them. And I pray for every one of these men, these fathers, these father figures, that you would bless them, strengthen them, continue, Lord, to use them. Help us as fathers you called us to be, the examples to our own children, to the children around us. And I pray, Father, this day and age, help us to keep standing on your word. Keep standing strong for Jesus. Bless them and keep them. Make your face shine upon them. Be gracious to them. Lift up your countenance upon them and give them your peace. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. There's a saying that we even say around here a lot of times. God is good. And there's a, then a reply that usually follows that. So if I say, God is good all the time, well, there, yeah, God is good. Uh, we will sing that now. This song says, God is good all the time. It's been a long time since we've sung this. So, Carolyn, if you'll just give me a note here, and I'll sing the, the verse, verse for you, and then you can join in. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in his heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, his light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. not ready for the key change yet all right okay you wait on us all right we're gonna sing it that first time first and then we'll let her change keys okay let's all stand together God is good God is good all the time he put a song of praise in this heart of mine God is good all the time Light will shine, God is good, God is good all the time. Sing it again. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, his light will shine. Oh. 
I'm not John Veal. John Veal is in the sound booth earning his keep. Thank you, John. But um, if you would, please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. We have so much to be grateful for, so much to be thankful for. This is a time where we just simply give back a little bit of what you've given to us. We have nothing without you. Lord, thank you so much and help us to be cheerful givers for you love cheerful givers. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Open up to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9. As you're turning and finding Mark chapter 9. 
A father watched his young son try to lift a heavy stone. And the little boy was just struggling trying to lift this. And the, the father said to his son, are you using all your strength? And the little boy said, yes, Dad, I'm, I'm, I'm using all my strength. And the father said, no, you're not. The little boy said, Dad, I'm using all my strength. And the father says, no, you are not. You haven't asked for my help. There is strength when we ask for help. You know, to ask for help, it's an appeal for urgent assistance. There's strength in asking for help. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus and three of his closest disciples are coming down a mountain. And maybe y'all are familiar with that passage, the, the Mount of Transfiguration. And on that mountain, Jesus begins to turn white, just reveals his glory, his glorification. And they find the other nine disciples, and they're arguing with the religious leaders. Surprise, surprise, right? Isn't it like you always look, look in the Bible, New Testament? They're always fighting with the religious leaders. And in the middle of this commotion, a man approaches Jesus, a man who needs help. Let's read the Word of God first. Mark chapter 9, verses 17 to 27. I'm in the New American Standard. You can just read where you are on the PowerPoint screen or in your own translation. Hear the Word of God first. Mark chapter 9, verse 17. And one of the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. And he, Jesus, answered them and said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him. When he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion. And falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he, the father, said, from childhood, it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. And after crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out. And the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, he is dead. Last verse, verse 27. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him up. And he got up. Would you pray with me? Father, this is your word, and so we stand on your word. And I pray that you'll help me to not rely on the cleverness of my words but on the power of your word. Speak, and may your word have its perfect will in our hearts and our lives and our minds this day. And help us to be doers of your word. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. So in this commotion, we find out, verse 17, that one of the crowd answers him. He says, teacher or rabbi, I brought you my son. So immediately we find out a little bit about this man. He's a father. He's a daddy. And then he says, my son possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And he begins to go into detail about the harm that this boy has had. And we find out later on, Jesus asks the father, how, how long has this been happening? And the father says, from childhood. So this boy, probably maybe an older teenager, could have been a young adult, but more than likely a teenager. Finally, this has been happening a long time. As a little boy, he had been tormented by this demon, causing him to fall into the fire, to foam at the mouth. There is an epileptic 
condition here, but we know ultimately it's a demonic presence. And by the way, folks, the demonic presences are real, all right? They're real in our world today. And people you sometimes see on the, the, the news, how can that person have done that and murdered all those people? <laughs> Duh. The man comes to Jesus and he asks for help. Not just once, not just, but twice. If you could do anything, take pity on us and help us. Help my unbelief. He's a man who asks for help. He's a dad who asks for help. Many of us here in this room, many of us men here, think of for a moment all the things your father taught you. You know, my dad taught me how to change a tire. He taught me how to mow the lawn. Taught me so many other things about life. Maybe your dad taught you some things, how to fish, how to hunt, maybe how to change the oil, maybe how to do different tasks. Did your father ever teach you how to, how to look for help, where to go for help? And every one of us here needs help at some time or another. And if you don't need help now, you will. And this morning, from God's word, I want to point you to this father who needed help. And whether you're a father or a father figure or a mother or a sister or a, a son or daughter or a brother, hear the word of God when it comes to needing help. Let's look at the example of this father who was willing to ask for help and what God's word can teach us this morning, what to do when we need help. Number one, first I want you to see that when we're in need of help, head first to Jesus. Head first to Jesus. Head straight to Jesus. Look at verse 17. Father says, teacher, rabbi, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And then notice, he goes on to say, I brought him to your disciples. I told your disciples to cast it out, verse 18. And they could not do it. Now, Jesus had given authority to his disciples. He told them, hey, you've got authority to cast out demons. You've got authority to preach the gospel. You've got authority to heal. And Jesus comes back, and he finds out this hasn't happened. And what's he say? You unbelieving generation, how long must I put up with you? He wasn't trying to disparage them, but he was just saying, look, you've got a faith problem. And so the father, he went to who he could, the, the disciples, but what a lesson here. You need help? Head to Jesus. What do people do when we have difficulties in life? A tendency is to run in the past would be self-help books. You know, when, when, just out of college, I remember the self-help section in the bookstore was huge, but these days we've got the internet. And you and I can go on and pull out our little phones or our, our tablets or go on our, our laptops and, man, i got this problem, let me figure out. Let me go on Reddit, see what Reddit says. Let me go on social media. Hey, I've got a friend to call. And I'm not saying we don't go to those other places eventually. I'm not saying we don't go to people eventually. But first and foremost, Jesus, where do I, what do I do? I shared with you all last year, last March, when it looked like we were going to probably have to cease worshiping for a while, I was anxious. I was, I was scared. I was fearful. And I went into our prayer room in the children's hall. And I cried. I'll be honest with y'all. I, I shed tears. And I was like, God, I pray you'll provide for my family. Lord, I don't know if, if what's going to happen to the church. Am I going to have a job? Am I going to be able to, to, to be a pastor after this? I didn't know. But I, I was open. I just went straight to Jesus. And not only did he provide for us the rest of last year, but when I heard so many people who were struggling last year in 2020, I had one of my closest walks. I just felt like I just was empowered. I just had this confidence in God. I'm not very smart, but I know first place I need to go, I need to go to Jesus. Head straight to Jesus. You know, another father in the Bible, a man named Jairus. Jairus had a, a daughter, 12 years old. I can identify with that. He too headed straight to Jesus. Listen to Luke 8, verse 41. And there came a man named Jairus. And he was an official of the synagogue. 
means he was very important. And he fell at Jesus' feet and began to implore him to come to his house. Verse 42, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. Hey, Jairus got it right. I thank the Lord for Jairus. Give me an example. As, as a father, I need to be reminded of that. I still have improvement in my life to demonstrate. My children see me open up my Bible every morning. But I need to let them see me come to Jesus when I've got a problem. You may not know the name Becky Stanley Broderson, but I bet you know her father. Her father's a man by the name of Charles Stanley. Becky Broderson said that the most important lesson she learned from her father is to pray about everything and trust God to answer my prayers. She said, Dad never considered anything too small to pray about. Men, we've got to head straight to Jesus. We've got to be like King Jehoshaphat. If you recall in the Bible, King, King Jehoshaphat had three armies coming at him at once. They said, Jehoshaphat, we're coming to attack you. The Bible says he was fearful. I don't blame him. He was scared, and I don't blame him. And he calls for a fast, he calls for a prayer, and he, he just gets open and real with God. Listen to 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12. For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. You ever felt that way? I don't know what to do. God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. That's what we do. Head first to Jesus. Lord, here's my problem, Lord. Just lead me, Lord, from here. Who do I go to next, Lord? What do I do? Raise up people around me in my life. Show me, Lord, what to do. Jesus tells us himself that as his disciples, apart from him, we can do what? Nothing. John 15, verse 5. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. What prophetic words Jesus shares here, you faithless generation, he calls them. Now, he's speaking to his disciples. All right, he's calling, he's saying, hey, look, you faithless generation. But understand, those words are timeless. We, too, are in a faithless generation. You say, how can you say that, pastor? How many people go straight to Jesus? How many people go straight to Jesus? Understand, people will let you down. Pastors will let you down. Church leaders will let you down. Human beings will let you down. Jesus will never let you down. William Barclay said, The church may at times disappoint us, and God's servants on earth may disappoint us, but when we battle our way face to face with Jesus Christ, he never disappoints us. Head first to Jesus. You've got a problem. You need help. Head first to Jesus. Number two, when we're in need of help, we need to be honest. We need to be honest with the Lord. Now notice this father, verse 22, he comes to Jesus and he's honest. If you could do anything, take pity on us and help us. In verse 23, Jesus says to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Verse 24, immediately the boy's father cried out. He cries out there and says, I do believe. Help my unbelief. You've got to admire his honesty. The best things that we can do for ourselves in our relationship with God is to be open and real with him. You know, we talked about this last fall. We went through a series I called Get Real. You may recall. We talked about that. And oftentimes in life, it's those times when we get open and real with God. Sometimes we want to play and we want to tiptoe, even in our prayer life. Oh, God, if, if you can, if you will, if you can do anything. And God wants us to be open and real. Even if we don't like what we're saying ourselves in our voice. A church I served a while back, we were surrounded by a cemetery, and I get to the point where I just, I don't want to be there. I remember talking to God and saying, God, I, why am I here? I really don't want to be here. And God didn't necessarily change the situation and say, okay, Brian, if you're through, come on, I'll send you elsewhere. He didn't do that. But what he did do was he changed my heart, he changed my attitude. And I got to the point where I just asked, God, just show me what you want to do here. Just show me something here. And he did that. 
He wants us to be honest and real with him. There's a Christian author named Sheila Walsh, I believe, and she was doing a book signing, and in this book signing, she had a woman come up to her, and the woman said, I'm so angry. And when she finished her book signing, she invited the woman to go take, she said, come take a walk. And so they went walking in a little part of the convention center, and she said, what happened to you? And the woman began to unpack just all of the, the trials and the struggles that she had, and seeing Sheila write in her book that she seemed to be just have it all together and even having some things this woman didn't. She said, she said I'm just so angry. And, well, and Sheila said, well, have you ever told God that? She says, oh, no, I can't talk to God. I can't talk to God that way. And she said, look, don't you think that God already knows that you're angry? He knows how fed up you are. And she went on to say that this woman who got real with God and expressed that anger experienced one of the closest intimate walks she ever had with the Lord. That's what happens. God wants us to be open, to be real. You know, the reason I believe that there are more spiritually women, there are more spiritual mature women in the church than there are men. And there are. I'm going to be honest. I love my brothers, but let's be honest. You see more women in the church today than you do men. Because ladies do a whole lot better job about this. We men want to act like we have it all together. Remember the olden days before we had GPS and we have to use a map? I mean, how many of us men would actually, okay, no, 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 I, I know where I'm going. Honey, why don't you ask for directions? No, 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 we'll, we'll figure this out. It's a man problem. It's a pride problem. But God wants us to be honest, brothers. If there was a man who got honest with God, it was David. Listen to Psalm 51, verse 6. David says, behold, you desire truth in the innermost being. God, that's what you desire, truth. In my innermost being. Psalm 145, verse 18. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. To all who call upon him in what? In truth. He is near to all those who call upon him in truth. God, I need help. I got a problem. Be honest. Head first to Jesus. Be honest. Number three, we, we need help. Be humble. Be humble about the affliction. Be humble about this need now verse 24 i'm going to bring you to again we could preach a whole sermon i could just park myself in verse 24 again immediately the boy's father cried out and he said i do believe that's the sunday school answer isn't it all things are possible to him who believes oh oh i do believe man i could go through this room right now and ask how many of y'all have faith i bet every one of y'all oh, i got faith Amen, I got faith. I'm a person of faith. But what separates this man from almost every other person is what he says next. Help my unbelief. I do believe. Help my unbelief. I know my faith is weak, he's saying. I know my faith is partial. I know my faith is incomplete. Still, I trust you, Jesus. If you don't deliver my son, then he will not be delivered. Help me in spite of this. He was honest and he was humble. Hey, you can be honest and not be humble. Think about Jesus tells the parable, Luke chapter 18, about a religious figure, a Pharisee, and a tax collector. And many of you know a tax collector was kind of like one of those sensational lawyers you see on the TV these days. And there's this honest, this very real honest Pharisee, hey, Lord, I, I fast twice a week. And I'm sure he did fast twice a week. Lord, I tithe on everything I receive, and I'm sure he tithed on everything he received. Lord, I thank you I'm not like this sinner. And I'm sure he was thankful he wasn't like that sinful tax collector. But then Jesus gives a description, a profile of the tax collector. He can't even go under the roof of the temple. He can't even look up. He beats his chest. And he says, God, have mercy on me, the sinner. And I want you to hear what Jesus says next. Luke 18, verse 14. Jesus says, he says, I tell you, this man, this tax collector, went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. That word justified, it means to be right in God's eyes, to be in that right relationship. When you and I humble ourselves and turn from our sin and turn to Jesus, 
we're justified. We're made righteous in the eyes of God. It's a contradiction of exaltation, I like to say. It's a contradiction of exaltation. When you and I exalt ourselves, God does what? He humbles us. But when we humble ourselves, God does what? He exalts us. This is what James writes. James 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. 1 Peter 5, verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. God wants us to humble ourselves and, and say, help me. God, I don't have it all together. And I've said to you all before, look, I'm never going to stand in this pulpit and make you try to think I've got it all together because I don't. Not a single one of us has it all together. That's why we need Jesus so bad. Amen? There's not a single person that has it together. And unfortunately, too much of you start getting in the church life. You start getting in to the brother, sister, amen, everything's good. God, and God is good all the time. All the time God is good. But not all the time are we doing so good. Be honest. Head straight to Jesus. Be honest. Be humble. Fourth and finally, look for his hand. Look for the hand of the Lord. I'm not saying talk to the hand. Look for the hand. Verse 25. He rebuked the unclean spirit saying to it you deaf and mute spirit I command you come out of him and do not enter him again and after crying out and throwing him into a terrible convulsions it came out and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said he's dead but Jesus took him by the hand and raised him and he got up the man got real and said hey Help my unbelief. And Jesus began to command the, the spirit, come out. Now this demonic spirit put up a fight, didn't it? Crying out, throwing the poor boy into terrible convulsions. But it came out. And it was such a big deliverance, everybody thought the boy was dead. They thought it was a corpse there. But Jesus took the boy by the hand and raised him up. And that father got to see something he hadn't seen in years. He hadn't seen since his boy was just a little boy. He saw his son delivered. He saw a miraculous work. The disciples couldn't do it. Nobody else could do it. Only Jesus could do it. Now listen. Literally the text reads in the Greek. Literally. Jesus raised him and he was resurrected. Jesus raised him and he was resurrected. You see, Jesus provides us insight into the meaning of his own death and his own resurrection. Jesus is pointing them to himself. The whole purpose Jesus came, he suffered, died, rose again to forgive us of sins, to offer forgiveness, to reconcile mankind to God. I don't know who said this, but I can't take credit for this. Someone said, Satanic powers bring death. Divine powers bring resurrection life. Satanic powers bring death. Divine powers bring resurrection life. Amen to that. When a man is heard saying, Lord, I need help, that might be the greatest miracle there is. So often we want to look at a miracle of a divine, a physical miracle. Wow. Man, you were sick and now you're healed. Man, the cancer is gone. That's a miracle. But so, I, I believe the greatest miracle, even greater miracle than that, is seeing a prideful, sinful man caught up in his own ways who says, Lord, I need help. And the Lord transforms his heart and makes him a new man. That's the miracle. That's the miracle here. And Jesus responds to the faith the man has and heals his son. Even though the man admitted a lack of faith, Jesus didn't send him away. Jesus didn't say, all right, yeah, your, your faith is, is not as strong. Go back and, and strengthen your faith and come back and see me in the morning. Maybe I'll talk to you. Jesus helped his son. In doing so, he helped this man overcome his unbelief. And don't miss this. Don't miss this. 
this event, this account, it's sandwiched between two predictions of Jesus suffering death and resurrection. At the, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus unpacks this prediction. The Son of Man will suffer, will die, and rise again. Just after this, he gathers his 12 disciples together. Hey, the Son of Man's going to suffer, he's going to die, he's going to rise again. And the last half of, of Mark's book all points to Christ's cross and resurrection. And yet, all along the way, Jesus stops to care for people. He's on his way to the cross. He's on his way to accomplish the greatest task in mankind history, but he doesn't go on without stopping to help those along the way. Even a father whose son is demon-possessed. Jesus was enough. Jesus was enough for that man. He was enough for the son, and he's enough for you. And he's enough for me. You see, this story is about a man with weak faith in a strong Savior. And in the end, it's not the strength of your faith or my faith. In the end, it's about the strength of our Savior. It's about the strength of your Savior. It's not about how good you are or I am. It's about how good he is. Don't miss this. This passage is not about a boy or a father or even the faith. It's about Jesus. It's about the strong Savior who wants us to come to him in, in need of help. I'm going to ask you all to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. As we get ready to have a response this morning, all heads bowed and eyes closed. Jesus Christ came to suffer and die and rise again for the forgiveness of sins, to bring us eternal life, to bring us abundant life. And maybe he's calling you this morning to come to him to receive him as Lord and Savior. And I'm going to do something I normally don't do, but I really feel led to do this. And I'm going to address our men for just a second. All heads bowed and eyes closed. Facebook can't pick up you guys. But I'm going to ask my men if any of y'all would be bold enough. My, any man who would be bold enough to just raise your hand and indicate you just desire to be a better man for Jesus. I got any men this here this morning be willing to raise your hand and say, I want to be a better man for Jesus. God bless you, brothers. You can put your hands down. I'm going to ask others of you this morning, men, women, young men, young ladies, all heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking. If you need help about something this day, is there something that, Lord, I need your help. Would you be willing to just raise your hand for just a moment and just say, Lord, I need help. I need help about a situation. All right, God bless you. you can put your hands down. I want to pray over you and myself. And we're going to have a time of response. And at the close of this response, I'm going to ask, particularly my men, but anyone, particularly my men, my, my fathers, my father figures, would you be bold enough to just come to this altar and just say, I want to be a man for Jesus. In this day and age where so many of our, our boys are being exposed to so much femininity and wrong messages and people trying to downplay the importance of being a man. I want to invite my men and my fathers especially to come to this altar at the end of this prayer and devote yourself to Jesus. Father, I thank you so much for everyone in this church body, this sanctuary this morning, willing all these men, these brothers who just raised their hands so that they want to be a better man for Jesus. Lord, honor that in a mighty way. Pour your blessing and favor and start today. Take those brothers by the hand and help them and myself to become better men for Jesus. Father, there were others raising their hands, men, women, saying that they need help about something. You know what that is. All that matters is that you do. Would you help? Would you work? Would you move? Would you draw them to come first to you, to be honest, to be humble? And I pray, Father, you'll show your hand in a mighty way, maybe an unexpected way they never expected to see your hand. We come before you now, just as we are, 
offering ourselves to you. Would you show up and show off? We come to you now and ask all this for the glory of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand as you come, as the Lord calls you through this morning. Just a reminder, tomorrow night we do have men's fellowship at Howard's Cabin. Um, as we close, I've got a personal friend of mine this morning, John Forsyth, we're seminary brothers. He's a minister. Uh, come and um, take his family to Charleston. He drove up this morning to join us in worship. I'm so grateful for him. So I'm going to ask him to close us in a word of prayer this morning. A special Father's Day, and we'll be dismissed. So my brother John. Well, this is, uh, this is not... Um um, worship your pastor day at all. This is Father's Day, but uh, I have to tell you that this man has been a blessing in my life for a very, very long time since we were in uh, seminary class number one, and I won't say what year that was, but uh, um, I know you know what a blessing he is, and uh, his message this morning um, certainly is true uh, to the way he feels about the Lord Jesus Christ. So we thank the Lord for him today as well. You join me as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful. We're thankful to you for who you are. We're thankful for all that you've done in our lives. And Lord, there are times in our lives, as the pastor has spoken of this morning, when the only thing we can do is come to you. And we thank you that, uh, that through Jesus Christ we have access to you. We thank you that the gift of the Holy Spirit is working inside of us. And we're thankful, Lord, for what that does, what that means to us, because we are the ones that are in always, always in need of help. And you are the one who takes that humble spirit and you do something with it. We're thankful for that, thankful for what you're doing in this church, and thankful, Lord, for what this church is doing in this community just to raise up the name of Jesus Christ. We ask you for your blessing on that. 
and your blessing on us as we go from this place today that we might shine a light brightly for, for you, God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.